Hi everyone, my name is Karen Willison. I'm a senior contributor editor here at The Mighty and I want to welcome you to our Disability Employment Awareness Month panel. Today I have two wonderful guests with me. I have Matteo Lieb, Employment Policy and Program Manager at National Down Syndrome Society and David DeSanctis, Actor and Public Outreach Associate at the NDSS. I will let both of you introduce yourselves a little more and tell the audience about you. Would you like to go first, Matt? Sure, yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, and first off, I'd like to thank The Mighty for uh, giving David and me the opportunity to speak with everyone. And then I'd like to thank everyone for, for tuning in today. Um, first off, as you said at the beginning, this is, this is all about employment. And uh, even though we're nearing the end of October, I want to uh, wish everyone a very happy National Disability Employment Awareness Month. This month has been uh, such an amazing experience for us at the National Down Syndrome Society to highlight the success that folks with disabilities have in the workplace, uh, but also acknowledging the challenges that continue to exist and the work that needs to be done. Um, as you said, I am the Employment Policy and Program Manager at the National Down Syndrome Society. Um, I do a couple things. First off, I manage our DS Works program. Um, the fundamental core of what this program does is increase access to the workforce for folks with Down syndrome. Um, we do that in a couple ways. We, we produce resources um, that we share with our over 300 local partners and affiliates throughout the country. Um, we actually just published one on Friday, which I'm super proud of. Uh, it's called Partnering for Career Success. Uh, it was a document that I developed with uh, a, a great self-advocate um, by the name of David Egan, who works for Source America. It's available on our website um, for anyone to access, and we encourage you to look at that and share that with your uh, with your network. Um, so uh, the other thing we do is we work with uh, corporate um, entities, whether they're large, small, uh, or medium. We work with all companies looking to hire folks with Down syndrome and provide them with the tools that they need uh, to do that uh, in, in an effective way. Um, and other things I do, I work with our National Advocacy and Public Policy Center on, on employment policy. One, one piece of legislation that my colleague David's going to talk about later is uh, phasing out subminimum wage practices. Uh, we work on uh, the local, state, and federal level on, on these policies, and, and that's one in the employment area that we're particularly invested in. Um, I also manage our CEO Commission for Disability Employment, which focuses on bringing together corporate leaders to increase access to the workforce for folks with disabilities. Um, and prior to that, I worked in supported employment in Washington, D.C., in the mental health space. Um, and really, fundamentally, what I did was helping folks with severe mental illness access competitive, integrated uh, employment opportunities. So once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Karen, to uh, speak with you all today, and, and I'm really excited for our conversation. Hey. Absolutely. Great. So, David, would you like to introduce yourself now? Tell us about what you do at NDSS. Yeah. Hey, guys. I am David DeSanctis. I am the, I was the Public Relations Outreach Associate for the National Down Syndrome Society. Now I am the Public Outreach Associate for the National Down Syndrome Society. Now, and what I do with them is that I do video blogs and written blog, blog posts and video blog posts, AKA vlogs. I even make playlists now for NDSS functions like buddy walks and marathons. Now, um, that's it for me of uh, the National Down Syndrome Beret, but I posted a website out of www.wehelpgrowsberet.com. I am also an actor that he plays as produce and we help grows. On the top that I am a Commonwealth Council on Developmental Disabilities board member for the state of Kentucky as well. I'm a maintenance person at the Bluegrass Harley Davidson here in North Louisville, Kentucky. I'm a lecturer at um, Church of Epiphany here in Anchorage, inside of, of Anchorage, Kentucky, of Louisville, Kentucky, which is 10 minutes away from my house. So there are so many things of who I am. 
I can go on no, on an endless list, but I can't do that tonight. Great, thank you, David. That sounds like a really fun job. <laughs> Um, Mateo, how about, uh, could you talk a little bit about the accessibility concerns and barriers in op employment opportunities today? No, definitely. And, and thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, accessibility is key for, for folks looking to um, access the workforce. And, and I think when historically, when folks have thought about accessibility, we traditionally think about physical accessibility. And, and for, for those who don't know what that might look like, we're talking about, you know, our buildings accessible uh, in, in a variety of ways, whether that's, uh, you know, ramps, having doors that can be opened uh, in, in an accessible manner, um, having doors that are of the appropriate uh, um, dimensions for a wheelchair user to get through. But, but increasingly, we're, we're focused also on the digital or virtual accessibility. And I think that has become even more pre uh, prevalent as we are at home um, and dealing with, with the, uh, the quarantine associated, associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, those, the, the virtual or, or um, the online uh, accessibility is important as well. You think about something like what we're doing today. Um, is, is this accessible to folks who are, are tuning in? And that can take a variety of, of ways. Um, folks watching later will probably have access to closed captions. That's a way of making um, this webinar and, and other content accessible uh, in a virtual setting. Um, and employers increasingly need to think about accessibility on both sides of this, uh, of this equation. Um, one concept that we talk a lot about is universal design. Um, universal design means that when we're making something accessible, we, we should not be just thinking about how we can make it better just for folks with disabilities, but the fact that we design it universally to benefit a broader uh, audience. Now, there's a couple examples that come to mind. In, in the physical accessibility space, you think about, once again, a ramp. Um, of course, immediately you're, you're building a ramp because you want to give access to folks with disabilities who are wheelchair users. But you think about how that can have broader societal implications. Um, you know, a, a parent who uh, is trying to get somewhere with their child who's using a stroller. That person uh, does not have a disability, but they are able to benefit from that universal design. Uh, similarly, in the virtual space, um, something that we all, I'm sure, have gotten to take advantage of during, during the pandemic, uh, you know, when we're watching Netflix at home, um, and we use subtitles, right? That's, that's something that was uh, developed initially for folks who would need that uh, because of a disability, but closed captions have benefits to everyone, whether it's, um, you know, you don't want to have the, the television on as loud or you struggle to understand what a person's saying, um, and therefore it benefits us all. So I think accessibility really needs to be thought of in both spheres, the physical and the virtual. Now, when it, you ask me about barriers, what barriers exist, um, you know, obviously we're, we're at a place where some progress has been made, but it's clear that more is needed. Um, when one looks at the Federal Reserve data, um, over the past 10 years, people with disabilities have been employed at about a third the rate of those without disabilities. And that really highlights the fact that we have a lot more work to do. Um, now, looking deeper into what those barriers are, um, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics did a study in 2019, and, and that study found that the, a person's disability itself was one of the most significant barriers which to me is, is sort of tricky to understand what that means. And, and I wanted to look deeper into sort of what, what are the specific reasons? And, and I think what comes next makes more sense. So 12% of folks cited a lack of education or training as a barrier. Uh, a little over 10% cited a lack of transportation access. Uh, roughly 10% cited a need for accommodations. Uh, and 7.6% cited workplace attitudes between their, their colleagues and employer as a barrier to employment. And, and those categories, I think, highlight really what some of those big concerns are and those big barriers for folks with disabilities to access employment. And so each of those come with their own unique solutions, either in the public policy realm or in individual companies shifting their own private policy 
uh, to making their workplaces more accessible and, and removing some of those barriers. Uh, with transportation, there's lots of things that you can think of. Um, with accommodations, you know, the, the ADA mandates that employees with disabilities have a right to a reasonable accommodation in the workplace, but many, many uh, employees with disabilities don't get access to them. And many employers aren't aware of the kind of accommodations that can be really useful. And, and so really to address these barriers, it's gonna take a lot of stakeholders. We need to have our self-advocates on board. We need to have people with disabilities speaking up and really highlighting what they need to make this uh, a better workplace for all. And then we need our employers to come on board. We need them to play an active role. And I think we'll get into that a little later. And finally, we need people like David and myself who work for organizations like the National Down Syndrome Society and other advocacy organizations to step up and, and really, of course, David, um, and really play our part and, and make this make society more accessible uh, for all. Yes, David, do you want to talk a little bit about some of your experiences working as an actor? What's been fun about it? What's been difficult about it? Well, at first, I thought that me memorizing all of the 138 lines were impossible and hard and tough and rough for me to memorize them. But, well, I took it day by day, and, and I memorized each line then of, of as it went. And so it got then easier of as the days goes by. That's great. And uh, have you, so what were your, some of your favorite parts of being in Where Hope Grows or working as an actor? What do you love about it? Um, one of my favorite uh, scenes was one of the scenes that was taken out from the movie, and, uh, which was getting snow cones with McKinley Miller's character of Kitty Kingball. But the favorite part of it, working on the set of Where Hope Grows and, uh, was that we were all started in the way of as as a hard working crew and a group. Then by the end of the time of wrapping things up, by the end, we became into a family. So my favorite part on the set is spending time with my movie family. That's great. It sounds like it was a wonderful experience for you. And I just, you know, I really hope that we continue to see more opportunities for people with disabilities and acting. It's an area where I know that we've, you know, really been underrepresented as a community. So exactly. And yeah. So I've transitioned myself from being a, a normal person of as who I am into being the look of the draw of becoming the actor and we hope grows. Then after that, I transitioned back into the normal life again. Then uh, uh, with me working inside of a grocery store at Trader Joe's, being the very first person that has Down syndrome that had worked in a national train store like that. That's great. And then after that, uh, now I'm the very first person that has Down syndrome that's a maintenance person or that works in a motorcycle shop now at Harley-Davidson. So, that's yeah. great. That sounds like fun. <laughs> that's so cool. So let's let's go to Mateo. I would like to ask you, what in, what about inclusive education programs can help pave the way for employment opportunities? How can teachers and parents help prepare people, especially with intellectual and developmental disabilities for integrated employment? Yeah, no, I mean, that's such a great question. Um, inclusive employment, or inclusive education rather, and inclusive employment, uh, but inclusive education in particular is so important when you look at the trajectory that a person's gonna have uh, going into their career. Um, the Department of Education um, in the fall of, found that in the fall of 2018, 36%, so we're, we're talking, you know, a sizable group of students with disabilities were not included 
in the general education classroom for at least 80% of the day, which is which is a, a sort of a standard for that we look for in inclusivity in education. Um, that lack of inclusion really hurts a student's chance of graduating from high school. Um, now, I, I'm obviously not the first one to say this, but if you don't graduate from high school, that severely impacts your, uh, your professional prospects. What we see a lot of are folks uh, getting certificates of completion, which don't have necessarily the same uh, credit and value to an employer as a high school diploma would have. And uh, therefore, pulling someone out of the general ed classroom and, and, and uh, excluding them really hurts their academic prospects, but also hurts their professional prospects by not adequately preparing them for the workforce. So we really want to see students with disabilities included as much as possible. And, and studies have found that when students are fully included, they're five times more likely to graduate. So going back to what I just said, if we want to have a workplace that includes people with disabilities, we got to start by including them in the classroom as well. And not only do we see better academic outcomes, i.e. better graduation rates, but also other benefits, societal, uh, social benefits, communication benefits, um, all these things that students develop when, when they're in the school system. So we really need to make sure that we're including our students with disabilities as much as possible. Now, you, you asked the teacher or parent role. Now, a teacher's role, first and foremost, is driven by a student's academics. Of course, their, their job is to go in and, and help them learn the material and support them in whatever way is most appropriate. But on the other hand, as I referenced earlier, school offers a lot of other benefits. And, and in, a, in a general education setting, that teacher can really take a hands-on role with both students with and without disabilities and, and really help them uh, develop into the professional that they're eventually going to be. And so the teacher's role is very, very important there. Um, with regards to parents, you know, we want our parents to advocate um, for uh, their children uh, with disabilities um, and help connect them with the necessary resources that are out there. Um, but one of the things I, I caution parents uh, when it comes to the employment side of things is that at the end of the day, it, it's, it's your child who's trying to get the job, not you. Um, now, previously, I used to work uh, as I referenced in the mental health space, I worked as uh, an employment specialist, which is also known as a job coach. Um, and when I worked there, I saw parents that were really, really engaged, which is great. They were really invested in their children and, and trying to get their children to be as successful as possible. But oftentimes I would see parents getting in the way of, of what their children were looking to do. And that can take many forms, whether it's a parent deciding that a job may or may not be appropriate when that person wants to pursue it, or um, a parent taking the role of the candidate, right? And I would say this all the time, when, when, a, when a person with a disability or anyone is looking for a job, they're presenting themselves as a candidate to the employer. And so even as a job coach, I would, I would have uh, my clients ask me, Mateo, can you help me, uh, you know, communicate uh, or, or, or you know, share something with the employer. Um, I want you to do that instead of me. Um, of course, I'd be there to support the clients no matter what. I provide every support I need. But when the client was asking me to do that instead of them, um, that's where sometimes I, I would have that conversation around why. You know, what is it? How can we empower you to, to be that, that person that you're looking to be? And so, so with parents, I, I want to make sure that parents, of course, are involved and advocate um, and are engaged. But I, I oftentimes caution around sort of stepping over that line of taking too much of a role on that person, um, especially when that, that person with a disability may not want um, their parents to be as involved as they're being. That's great. I would actually love to go to David if we can real quick. David, would you like to talk about how wage discrimination affects the disability community? Yeah. Um, at the 14C thing that goes all the way back to the 1930s uh, right after the Great Depression that we need to get rid of, like forever. 
Um, because back then, people like us that has Down syndrome um, were being paid like one cent or 10 cents or 15 cents no, 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 to work from back then. And it's still going on of now of 86 years later. And it's outdated and it's outmoded. And we just need to get rid of it. It's we just need to be, we need to have equal fair wages as same as our typical peers get of in today's and nowadays society and reality of now. And and we need to be treated as the way that our typical peers are being treated as well, with respect and not being discriminated on. Than that through employment and other ways because we have to be accepted for who we are, the way we are created, the way that we are created through God's image. Absolutely. And I feel like so many people don't know that it's legal to pay people with disabilities less than minimum wage. That And and usually when they find out, they're, they're really upset. They're really horrified by it. And so I think it's so important that you're talking about this and getting more awareness out there so we can do something about this problem. Yeah, especially for uh, the people that who are like African Americans and Black Americans, because there is a, a video that I'm going to uh, paste in the private a chat to be uh, brought up on here um, that from a show called Dykes the Raven, then that um, they don't hire black people and that is so discriminatory of on skin colors and I hate that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and put it in the chat. And Yeah, so talking about that, let's talk about some of the other barriers to employment, the other challenges that people with disabilities face. Um, Mateo, can you talk about how federal and state disability programs like SSI, SSDI, and Medicaid affect employment? And also, what are some of the solutions for the challenges that they create? No, definitely. Uh, that's that's a great question. And, and um, you know, the programs that you just referenced, uh, SSI and SSDI, Medicaid, Etc. Many of those are are means tested. Um, what what does means tested mean? That means that they're normally income um, or and in often cases uh, asset limitations uh, for the beneficiary. What does that mean? That means that the person can only earn so much on a monthly basis, um, but and can also only have so much in in assets in a, in a bank account or, or other places, etc. So. Because of that limitation, because of that, that means tested factor, uh, employees with disabilities are often faced with a choice. Earn more and, and go get that job that you really want, that, that pays what you're looking for, that'll give you the kind of life that you're looking for and risk losing your benefits or earn less um, from employment and don't put those at, at risk. Um, and I think that that's not a, not a great choice. And what it does is it keeps people with disabilities in, in a cycle of poverty oftentimes that um, really is, is been going on for quite a while. When you look at poverty rates for folks with disabilities compared to those without, we see huge disparity there. Um, and and that's, that's a real problem. We wanna promote employment for folks with disabilities, but we need to make sure that they continue to get the supports they need. So when you look at these programs, they, they weren't, set up for people with disabilities in the truest sense. In reality, they were set up for, you know, lower income individuals. And, and when you look at Medicaid in particular, it, it offers really important benefits for people with disabilities, P benefits that help maintain independence. And from an employment perspective, the obvious one that comes to mind is job coaching. 
um, that help support people with disabilities in their jobs. So if you're a person with a disability who's faced with a choice um, between losing that and, and earning more, well, the Medicaid helps you keep that job. And, and it's, it's a very, very hard decision um, to say, well, I'm gonna forego that and, and keep working because then you're, you're losing that benefit that helps you keep your job. And so we really wanna make sure that folks are aware and, and information is key. Um, so I encourage all folks with disabilities to, and, and their caregivers and family members to learn um, through benefits counseling and, and learn what tools are available to people. Um, there are things uh, available through our vocational rehabilitation programs. We have folks called community work incentives coordinators, also known as CWICs, who are certified to provide that kind of assistance. Um, and folks can also go to their supported employment providers if they're connected to one um, and normally get some good information. Now, what can we do? The first thing is that we, we have done some positive things as a society to address these issues. And I think specifically to ABLE accounts um, as a way of achieving that. So ABLE accounts allow people to save money. It is a savings tool um, without uh, that asset limitation being under threat. So when you look at something like SSI, uh, there is a $2,000 asset limit, but a person with a disability can create an ABLE account and, and put thousands of dollars uh, into that ABLE account per year um, and, and use those uh, funds for specific approved expenses that relate to their disability. And if they go over that $2,000 within their ABLE account, um, it doesn't impact their eligibility for SSI. However, one very important thing that an ABLE account does not do is it does not change any income limits. So a person uh, is still faced with the same income limits that they would be without that ABLE account. So programs have to work better for people with disabilities. And in particular, we need increased flexibility with regards to those income limits that I just alluded to. And we need to make sure that we're keeping long-term supports and services for folks with disabilities um, as a fundamental uh, part of, of access for, for this community. And one thing that I often look at is, is something like the Medicaid buy-in program. So um, the state of Washington, uh, passed House Bill 1199 in uh, April of 2019, and it went into effect earlier this year. What does it do? It removes income and age uh, threshold for eligibility for their Medicaid buy-in program. So what that means is that a person who is working and, and uh, has a disability can earn uh, over what they normally would be able to earn and still be eligible to buy into the state Medicaid program so that they can have access to those benefits. Um, this is a really great way of, of encouraging folks with disabilities to continue to achieve success in employment while at the same time not threatening those vital benefits that they need to achieve success. So I think we really need to examine our benefit system um, and make sure that people with disabilities and their success are at the forefront of any changes in the future. Yes, Yes, absolutely. We have some people in the in the chat talking about this. Someone asking, can I keep social security disability and have a job? And the answer is yes, but it's complicated. And how much you can make and the opportunities that are available to you are going to depend on what state you're in and how much you're earning and various other factors. So yes, but you're going to have to do some research yeah. and look into it. I would definitely, sorry, I, I would definitely encourage folks to do the research. Um, every every situation is unique uh, for for every person. Mm -hmm. um, and and what I would encourage you to do once again, as I referenced earlier, is to speak to a benefits uh, specialist who can look at the specific situation um, and and highlight any available tools that can help you with your benefits and and calculate the specific um, optimal situation for you. Um, that would be that would be my recommendation. And how does somebody go about finding a benefit specialist? I met with one through vocational rehab. Are there other options for people who want to meet with a benefit specialist? Yeah, I mean, so so the first thing I would do is, is um, you know, yeah, as you said, go to your, if you're connected to a vocational rehabilitation counselor, that would be a great place to to start. Um, and, and, uh, from there, they'll, they'll more than likely be able to connect you to uh, the appropriate place. The other thing you can do is, is, as I said, connect with a community work incentives coordinator 
there is a way to find those uh, professionals within your area. And I believe um, I'll find the link and, and, and put it available for folks. Um, you know, you could put in your zip code and it'll show you where that person might be. Um, and then the other thing, which isn't necessarily a person, but, but a resource in general is I would, I would go to the social security administration's website. Um, when, when it's, when we're talking about a social security benefit, um, I remember as the pandemic was, was getting underway and folks with disabilities were being faced with challenges left and right. Things like what does the economic stimulus payment that the, uh, that the CARES Act uh, put into effect. How is that going to impact my benefits? These are really important questions that folks were being faced with in, in real time. And, and I would oftentimes direct people to the Social Security website for, for that information. So um, yeah, look, look for those uh, counselors in your, in your area, connect with your state VR representative, and uh, of course, look, look to Social Security directly. Yeah, you can also Google Medicaid buy-in and then the name of your state or working disabled program. Those tend to apply uh, to Medicaid specifically. So if you have an issue where you need uh, work support or you need personal care attendants, direct support workers, that type of thing, then that will tell you if you could earn more money and still keep your Medicaid. So those, yeah, there's a lot out there, but it, it is complicated. It, it is, and, and it shouldn't be. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. So. Yeah, so I think we can move on to the next question though, which is talking about self-employment and entrepreneurship for people with disabilities and what can we do to make these career paths more widely available? No, um, it's a great, sorry, didn't know if I was muted or not. And that was gonna bound to happen at least once. Um, so no, great question. Um, entrepreneurship is such an important part of many people's professional journeys. Um, and we at the National Down Syndrome Society are super excited to continue focusing on entrepreneurship. And um, there's a website I'd like to direct people to um, that we've put together recently this year, um, which highlights uh, entrepreneurs with Down Syndrome that um, are open for business. Um, we have over 50, um, businesses that we're featuring on our website and we continue to grow that list. If, if you know of a business that's not featured on there or you yourself are an entrepreneur with Down syndrome that would like to be uh, listed, um, you know, please, please reach out to the National Down Syndrome Society and we'll get you guys listed on there. But um, really entrepreneurship offers such a great path to finding that sense of purpose, that sense of community um, and a source of income for people with disabilities just like anyone else. Um, when we, you know, wake up in the morning, uh, most of us want to do something that we enjoy doing. And entrepreneurship, uh, through its nature, is is an amazing way to do that because you are your own boss and you're determining the direction in which uh, you're going. And hopefully, you do you do something that really um, makes you happy. Now, oftentimes when I talk to parents and they'll say they'll ask me, you know, Mateo, I, I I'm thinking of starting a business for for my child with Down syndrome. Um, you know, I think this is a really good idea. Um, and I'll say, oh, well, great. it sounds like a great idea. Why, why are you thinking of starting a business um, for, for your loved one? And the response I'll get is, well, because I don't think that my loved one can get a job. Um, and, and when folks respond in that manner, it gives me pause because I, I can't disagree, right? It is, it is 100%, you know, we, we can't deny the fact that it is much harder for folks with an intellectual and developmental disability such as Down syndrome to access the workforce. There are barriers as we discussed earlier. Um, but do I think it's impossible? Of course not. I, 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 I'm proud to be doing what I do to, to continue making it better. Um, and so I would, I caution against viewing entrepreneurship as an option of last resort. Um, it should really be something for folks who have a, a genuine passion. And um, now that can happen you know, after someone's looked for a job and maybe not had success because they realize that the jobs available to them are not falling in line with their true passion. And, and that's, you know, a, a situation where starting a business makes a whole lot of sense. But as I said, starting one as an option of last resort is, is not necessarily, um, in my mind, the, the best way to go. What we've seen is COVID-19 has also presented folks with that challenge, but to a greater degree, right? Folks with disabilities and without are facing tougher economic and employment situations. And we've seen 
um, more and more self-advocates start their own business during this time because of those reduced opportunities. And so I look at entrepreneurship as a really great way to pursue your passion and pursue something that you want to do professionally um, and control your own destiny and, and do that in a way that makes you genuinely happy um, and shows the world what folks with disabilities and, and in our case, folks with Down syndrome um, can do. And, and it's, it's just a very positive thing. Yeah, so let's, I want to I want to ask another question. Let's start with you, David, and then Mateo, you can answer after. What are some things that businesses can do to help with employment and hiring and to be welcoming to people with disabilities? Just invite them, just invite them in into the just invite them into their place of business and and let them to give them a tour of the place for them to look at if they are interested if they like to work there. Like that's it. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's good. Do you have thoughts, Mateo, on how businesses can be welcoming and make no. this easier? Oh, there's 100%. one oh. other place that Go I ahead, David. could think of. Um, it's what the National Down Syndrome Society does. It's called C21s. It's a pop-up a restaurant where they hire up a people that comes to this event called C21 is a pop-up restaurant to see what we can do with our abilities so they can hire us right then and there on the spot. Uh, in the spotlight there in this event called C21 to hire them to work for them and their companies for them. No, definitely. Uh David, David, bring, you know, our C21s are such amazing events for um, anyone who's had the chance to attend them. I, I've, atten I've attended one myself earlier this year. And, and as David said, they're a great way to show the community and employers um, how folks with disabilities can uh, do amazing things. Um, Karen, to your question about how employers play a role, um, you know, it's, it's businesses play a huge role. The, the employer community is so important to making sure that our um, that folks with disabilities get greater access to the workplace. Um, they're, our, they're one of our biggest allies. And, and I think to when um, President Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act 30 years ago, um, in his remarks, he talked about the fact that um, this piece of legislation is, is you know, a, 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 the business community needs to take a big role. And, and, and I 100% agree with that. Um, so really, when I think about it, there are, there are three things fundamentally that the business community needs to do uh, to help with employment. The first is that businesses really need to see the value of hiring a person with a disability. Um, you know, once again, when I have conversations with employers, I, I don't want them to hire a person with a disability just because they view it as the right thing. That to me is not gonna be an effective long-term solution to this problem. We need employers to see the value. We need employers to understand that when you hire a person with a disability, they're bringing strength. They're bringing value to that company, just like hiring anyone else would be. And so while of course I admire companies that want to do uh, the right thing and, and do something to benefit society overall, I'm skeptical of when that's the only reason. And that's just the only factor that, that motivated that particular employer to make that decision. So, so as I said, that first thing is we need the business community to understand that, that the disability community offers tremendous value. Uh, it's an amazing talent pool um, it's, it, and it's massively untapped. And so when a business is looking for that competitive advantage, it's a no brainer. They need to be looking at this community as an asset. The second thing is that a business needs to assess their internal culture and work environment. We, we need to make sure that they're, that people with disabilities are br being brought into a place that's going to support and accept them. So, so while focusing on talent acquisition and hiring is important, we also need companies to focus on uh, their own their own house, 
so to say. Um, and that can be done in so many different ways. There's some amazing training resources out there. Um, and I would direct folks to a resource called Employing Abilities at Work, um, which is a certification offered through the SHRM Foundation, which is the Society for Human Resource Management. Um, in addition to that, there are a lot of other really great organizations that offer uh, resources and solutions to businesses about how to address their work environment. And that can be things like, once again, accessibility. We need to make sure that workplaces are accessible. Um, culture, benefits, um, ERGs, which are employee resource groups, and, and so many others. Um, and, and really, once again, looking at that internal culture is really, really important. Um, lastly, we need the business community to reach out to the disability community and, and, and be an active partner. And, and there's so many different partners in this space that there's you know, so many positive directions one can go. We talked about vocational rehabilitation. That's a great place to start. Um, every state has a vocational rehabilitation uh, agency. And those vocational rehabilitation agencies have folks who connect with the business community. That's, that's their role, is to be a liaison to the business community and to help uh, folks with disabilities access employment opportunities. And then those are across the country. And so by a business taking that active step and engaging, they're opening up uh, a pipeline to that talent. Um, the other thing that folks can do is engage with national organizations like us at the National Down Syndrome Society. Um, of course, there are so many other organizations uh, on the national level that focus on so many other disabilities that open up as, as many doors as possible. Um, and, and the other thing I'd say is, is focus on the local level too. You know, when I worked, um, for a supported employment provider on the local level. I worked with Fortune 500 companies and small businesses um, by building those relationships on the local level with those large companies. Um, and at the end of the day, those are the companies that are, you know, those are the people that are making those hires. It's, it's not the, the top of the corporate ladder, it's the hiring manager, it's the HR manager. Um, and those folks are on the local level. And so those local leaders, need to lead and need to reach out and need to and need to look to um, disability organizations and, and supported employment providers um, as an ally. And so I think those three steps of seeing the value, assessing their culture and working with the disability community could really make a big difference in how the business community engages with um, the disability community and, and bringing in more employees with disabilities. Yeah, those are those are great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think at this point, uh, we'd like to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please. Um, actually, you can say? Okay. No, yeah. um, um, actually, earlier in the private chat that I uh, posted a trailer up for a movie called The Color of Friendship oh. that I sent out for Camaro to post that out. Um, the color of a friendship is a Disney Channel TV movie that is about um, two friends. One is one is white from South Africa, and the other is black, that he lives in America and Washington DC. And then, uh, it's the color of friendship, meaning that you don't get to decide who your friends are. No, no, no. Um, that we don't get to choose who we want to be, be friends with at all because friends not only it's like an exception but no, no, or sharing the gifts of of friendship or uh, really it's like being uh, accepted of being of as a friend the of only of no matter what the content or the color of our skins are no no um so That's what the color of friendship is about. It just accept of 
who we are uh, and the color of our skin and all of that. That's great. I hope everybody will check that out. That's wonderful. Um, now, yeah, so we had a couple questions come in so far and hopefully we'll get more. So we had a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Wolf Girl wants to know, any advice for disabled students looking for a job? Employers are already reluctant to hire someone young and inexperienced, but needing accommodations on top of that turns off a lot of employers. So how would you both respond to her question? Yeah, I can, I can uh, give yeah. that a stab to start off with. Um, so I, I, I will say, you know, now the times we live in now are especially challenging given um, the pandemic and, and the fact that, you know, we are facing the economic realities um, because of the pandemic. Um, that being said, I, I think that there are a couple things that come to mind when how to engage with employers. First off, you, you referenced accommodations. Um, one thing when I talk to employers all the time is, is just to sort of fact check on, on the cost of accommodations. So uh, there is an organization out there called JAM, the Job Accommodation Network, which is absolutely amazing. Um, they are funded through the Department of Labor and, and they are one of the great resources when it comes to accommodations. Um, and what they, they consistently show is that accommodations are actually not expensive. Um, so over 50%, slightly over 50% of accommodations are um, cost nothing. And what, what does that look like? Modified work schedule is a great example. So if a person um, you know, needs to have a modified work schedule because of their disability, that doesn't cost the employer anything. And, and that can provide a world of difference to that person looking for a job. The other uh, share, which as I said, is less than 50%, costs on average $500. That, that is an investment for sure. But when you think about that investment over the lifetime or you know, the career time of, of an employee, that investment pays off tremendously. And there've been surveys after survey that show that hiring managers and, and HR personnel really see the value in those accommodations and see that as a long-term investment that yields positive results as opposed to um, you know, a, a short-term cost that's burdening. So that, that's how I would address the, the accommodations uh, concerns. With regards to how to, to find employers, um, you know, of course, engaging with some of the providers that I referenced earlier, vocational rehabilitation, RSA, a supported employment provider, um, but also getting yourself out there. Uh, you know, maintain an active presence on LinkedIn. Um, when, when you know that there's a particular place you'd like to work at, reach out to that employer directly and, and network with them. And, and now that we're all at home, um, folks might even be easier to access than they were before. So, you know, I, I would make sure to, to utilize all the resources available um, and to look at your disability as a strength. Um, you know, when I see some of the challenges that people go through because of the barriers presented by their disability, it reminds me just how much strength people with disabilities have and how much value, once again, I'm, gonna, I'm a broken record, I'm gonna keep on saying that word, but how much value people with disabilities bring to the workplace. And so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, another tip I would give is to look at organizations and companies that already have a good history of hiring people with disabilities or disability focused organizations because they're going to be more understanding of your situation. So you can look, for example, if you're a writer, you can look at publications that have a good history of, of disability related articles or you know, if you're a computer programmer, you can look for an organization that has a disability hiring initiative. It really depends on your, your individual career goals, but there are companies and organizations out there that already make hiring people with disabilities a priority. Yeah, and, and to, to build on that, Karen, there's um, some really great organizations out there that actually certify um, businesses as being uh, champions within this space. So, um, you know, if, you're in, if a person's interested in working for a large corporation, uh, Disability Inn is an organization that has an index um, 
and and they 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 run that index for companies. Um, and then there's another organization, the National Organization on Disability (NOD), that also um, you know has similar resources available to exactly what you were just saying. Um, seeing who those champions are um, that that show inclusion in the workplace day in day out. That's right. So we have another question, and it's probably going to have a similar answer. Yes, here we go. Uh, from Dagny, uh, who wants to know, how do you get hired after having a no employment gap, a gap in your resume? And do you think that people should speak about mental disorders up front when they are interviewing or applying for a job? Um, well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so employment gaps are, are definitely a challenge for job seekers. Um, and, and there's a couple ways that I would look at that. First off, uh, you know, in, in, when I would work with folks uh, and they had an employment gap, um, while there may be an employment gap from traditional employment, um, when I ask folks, what did you do uh, for that year, two years, three years, however long it was, the answer is never nothing. Um, people do things. Um, now, there's sort of the easiest one to justify in my mind is you were pursuing an educational opportunity. Um, that's a very easy gap to fill because when you're talking to an employer, you can show that you are out getting skills and becoming a better uh, asset to, to the workplace. But even if you weren't necessarily doing that, if you were um, you know, unemployed but not enrolled in school, you were likely doing things, um, whether that's personal things, um, you know, writing for, you know, reading, uh, playing sports. Um, these are things that you can translate into uh, an asset. Um, you know, I think of an example, um, you know, if, if you were not working, but, but you were taking care of a family member, that's, that's an asset. That's a real asset. Even if you're not trying to go into the, into the, you know, the, the, the social services or, or, or direct service field, um, it shows that you're committed to something. It shows that you did what you have to do to get a job done. Um, and so really, I, I would never look at it as a gap. And, and I would find ways to uh, reflect that on your resume. Um, the other question, I believe, was about how should you communicate about a disability? And I believe the, the reference was to uh, a mental illness up front. Um, that's, that's a really great that's a, that's a great question. Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act prevents an employer from discriminating against someone because of a disability. Um, that being said, <laughs> I'd be naive if I didn't say that discrimination exists in our society. That, that's just the case. There is, I've seen it, and I'm sure many of us have seen it. And so my recommendation is, of course, do what you feel most comfortable. Uh, when I worked with clients directly, um, Oftentimes I was there with them. And so when when a person has a job coach, um, oftentimes naturally in conversation it comes up as to why do you have a job coach? Um, and saying something to, to explain that, you know, well, I have uh, it's my job coach. Uh, he or she helps me with uh, employment. Um, and then communicating as much as you feel comfortable. Um, what I will say is um, if you have a need for a reasonable accommodation, um, it's important to communicate that up front because um, you wouldn't want the lack of an accommodation to have an impact on your performance and your success in a particular workplace setting. So while, you know, of course, I, I would defer to someone as to their, their level of comfort um, with disclosing a disability, um, I do see value in disclosing the need for an accommodation once hired. Um, that being said, if you do choose to disclose it, you want to do it in a way that's appropriate and that makes sense. Um, at the end of the day, an employer is hiring a candidate because of the skills and experience that they bring. Um, and so you want to always prioritize that first. As I said, to me, what's, what's the most important is that an employer hires you because of the asset and the value that you bring to an organization. They should not be just hiring you because they have, you have a disability. Just like they shouldn't hire me just because of the fact that I'm wearing this shirt or 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 that I have this haircut. Um, so folks should really hire people because of the value and the experience they bring to an organization. And so if you can find a way to communicate, uh, you know, your disability in an appropriate way that doesn't take away from your value as a candidate, then then I would defer to to that person. That's 
That was a great answer. So it, I haven't seen any more questions come in if I've missed anything. Um, I think that we can probably go ahead and offer final thoughts. And if any questions come in, I'll- I have a question. You have a question? No, sure, go I for have it. a question due to a question that's asked on here. Um, it's the um, same question about the, how do we get hired? The uh, okay, it's how do we get hired for the people that has no employment to get to have employment? Are you are you asking that to for me, David? Yes. yes. So how how you're asking how can people who have no employment history? Um, get a job. That that's that's a really good question. No, so no, no, because there are people that my sister knows that has no employment that is looking for jobs still. Yeah, that, so that is often the case for a lot of people. You know, especially when folks are earlier on in their career. Um, what what I would say to those people, and I want to be cognizant of time, uh, so I'll keep my answer brief, is much like I was talking about for employment gaps. Um, when when a person doesn't have formal employment history you wanna look for some of those other experiences that a person has had in their life that will bring value to um, an employer. Did you babysit a sibling growing up? Talk about that. That once again shows the employer that you had responsibility, that you had to follow directions and do tasks. Uh, did you mow the lawn? Were you on a sports team? All those things bring value to an employer. So I would recommend that a person who doesn't have a formal employment history um, look at what they've done in, in their life thus far and find the things that bring value to a potential employer. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll um, bring that up. I'm in a conversation with my sister Nancy. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Wolf Girl is saying, about a year ago, I waited until I officially got hired before mentioning my disability, and then they said they changed their mind. Is that legal? Should I have mentioned it earlier? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm almost positive that is not legal. Uh, can I can I repeat that answer? I am not a lawyer, but um, you know, if if they hired you and and then fired you um, after disclosing a disability, you know, obviously that there there may be other factors, and I'm and I'm not a lawyer, but but um, based on that, if if you're concerned about uh, the legality of it, um, states have disability law centers. Um, that offer uh, support to folks, especially with regards to discrimination cases. Um, I would I would contact them and, and see what they think. And, and of course, they will be lawyers, and so they'd be much better suited. Um, but yeah, that that's that sounds troubling to me for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, several years back, when I was in college of at the University of Louisville, I was applying for the same job that I do have of now at Harley-Davidson, but I was applying at another location though. The, the, one I look at, the one I look at now is the Bluegrass location. When I was in college, I was applying for the one on the Arthur Street. When the, when the owner had died off, his wife had taken the store over, meaning that, that uh, she had taken over the ownership of the store. And then when I was ab about to look into them, um, for them to hire me, for me to have a job, she saw me as a disability. And so my question, the, 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 they saw me as a, a liability really. And so my question is, how someone has pre-existing conditions that has Down syndrome as a liability and getting to be hired to be employed of in a job of when someone doesn't know you and yet the rest of the store had the led up and wanted to have that person to be hired to be working with them. I mean, I, I would say, David, you know, and I know we're we're pressed for time, so I'll keep keep this brief. But um, you know, 
a person should never be judged in for for an employment opportunity because of their disability. As I said, that's that's illegal, um, and and the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, made that the law of the land. So, um, you know, whoever it is, we want to make sure that they're being judged based on the value that they bring to an organization um, and not uh, their disability or any other health factor. So, um, no, great great comment, Karen. Thank you for for everything today. Absolutely. But I have been through the same thing as well. Um, I My uh, bachelor's degree is from Stanford University. I graduated. I started applying for jobs. I got tons of people interested in me. I would show up for the interview. They would see that I'm a wheelchair user and you could just watch their face change when I walked in, or wheeled into that interview and they saw that I had a disability. I was like, oh, they're not going to hire me. Like I just knew it didn't matter. They were just going to judge me. But eventually I did find a job. So it, it's hard, but don't give up. And Look for someone who's going to value you and accept you and to see you as an asset and all the abilities that you have and your skills and your talents. Exactly. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Mateo and David for being here today. Thank you so much for all this great information. And thank you all for attending this virtual event. Thank you. Uh, really enjoyable. You're welcome, Karen. Absolutely. You all have a great evening and stay safe out there. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Bye. Mm -hmm.